Aloha, everyone. Aloha, everyone. Oh. Aloha, everyone. Oh. Aloha, everybody. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, awesome. I think we're having a little bit of difficulties at the moment. This is brand new webinaring. So okay. we're trying to figure that out. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, awesome. It? All right. Yeah, okay. Brand new webinaring. <laughs> Thank so, you so much, everyone, for your patience. <laughs> okay. My name is Andrea Nandoskar. Uh, okay. Brand new webinaring. <laughs> Thank so, you so much, everyone, for your patience. <laughs> My name is Andrea Nandoskar. Okay, one sec. Okay, can everyone hear me? My name is Andrea Nandoskar, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Historic Hawaii Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as you can tell, this is our first virtual event, so we appreciate your, your understanding and your patience. Um, the event is Emma Nakuina and the Preservation of Hawaiian Culture. Today's presentation is an encore of the one shared at the 33rd annual Experts at the Cathedral Lunchtime Lecture Series this past February. The series showcased notable women in Hawaiian history in honor of the 2020 Centennial Commemoration of Women's Suffrage. Today's talk has been updated by our presenter based on her continuing research. HHF would like to extend a warm mahalo to the curators of the experts lecture series on notable women, Dr. Ralph Cam and Jesse Otto of the Historic Preservation Program, Department of American Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Before introducing our speaker, I'd like to share a few virtual housekeeping items. Today's presentation is being recorded and we'll be posting the video replay on the HHF website next week. If you have questions for the presenter during the talk and immediately afterwards, please type them in the Q&A box on the Zoom menu bar. Uh, we were live streaming on Facebook and YouTube and I, I may have had to abort that, but I'll see if I can get that going again. 
in any case, this will be recorded. We anticipate having about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A with our presenter, and we'll do our best to address as many questions as possible. If we don't get to your question, you can field those questions to me at andrea at historichawaii.org, which was in your reservation. We will um, forward these on to Uluvehi and we'll create um, a response board on the event webpage in a week or two so you can read responses to the different questions we couldn't get to. For those new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we are a statewide nonprofit that helps people save historic places, places that tell the stories of the multi layered history of Hawaii. We do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. Without further ado, I'd like to now introduce today's speaker. Uluvehi Hopkins was born and raised on Oahu, where her ancestors have lived for generations. She is currently a PhD candidate in the history department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her master's thesis, Hanau Ma Kalolo, for the benefit of her race, a portrait of Emma Kaili Kapuolono Metcalf Beckley Nakuina is the foundation for our discussion today. Uluvehi was first introduced to Emma Nakuina when researching her own family tree and found that she and Emma have Metcalf ancestors in common. By researching this amazing woman, Uluvehi has since been able to branch off into other fields of research, including Mo'olelo, water rights, and museums. We hope you enjoy her presentation. Aloha, everybody. Aloha, my kako. I hope everybody's good today. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, like Andrea said, this is um, sort of our, our, our first webinar, our first experience with a webinar. So I'm happy to be the guinea pig for that. Um, so <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and do the presentation run through. And they're going to be keeping track. Andrea will be keeping track of your questions. And hopefully, we'll get to a few of them at the end. Yeah. And then if we can't get to them all today, like Andrea said, we'll collect them and then we'll spend the next week trying to address them as well. Okay. So um, my name is Uluwehi Hopkins. Like Andrea said, I'm from here. And I found out that I had a familial connection to Emma Nakuina. And from there, everything just snowballed. Um, she is an endless source of information for me and an endless source of research topics for me. Um, pretty much everything that I research somehow, some way originates with her. So uh, her name was Emma Kili Kapuolono Metcalf upon her birth. Her husbands were first Beckley and then Nakuina. I like to call her a Hawaiian scholar. So we'll talk about that as, as we go through the slideshow here. Um, the reason why she's important is because when people are studying the 19th century history of Hawaii and even pre pre 19th century history of Hawaii, they tend to go to these guys. They're foreign chroniclers, right? Abraham Fornander, Alexander, Emerson, Thrum, Westervelt. Um, some of these guys, well, all of these guys spoke Hawaiian, not all of them really understood it that well, um, but all of their works have been translated or either originally written in English or were accompanied by an English translation. And that's why you guys have to excuse me, I actually live in a really noisy area. So if you hear sirens in the background, um, that's why. Uh, anyway, so whenever people are studying the history of Hawaii, they tend to turn to these guys, but here's the problem. None of these guys are actually Hawaiian. Now, when studying the 19th century and pre of Hawaii, and you do want a Hawaiian voice, then people turn to tend to turn to these guys, David Malo, E.E., e. Kamakao, Kepelino, Poi Poi, right? But here's the problem, they're all men. <laughs> and the reason why people tend to gravitate towards their work is because all of their work has been trans, well, not all, but a good, some of their work has been translated into English. So people who are studying the history of Hawaii find these guys the most accessible of the Hawaiian scholars. Of these, the only female on the list is Mary Kavena Pukui, but she's from the 20th century. And in fact, she's the one who did the translations for a lot of these guys. 
So there is a noted um, missing presence of female scholarship. And that's why Emma Nakuina is important is because she was writing at the same time that these guys were writing as well. And yet her name isn't synonymous with these guys and her name should be. So let's talk about her. Emma, Kalikapuolono Medcalf. Um, for those of you that have seen previous, uh, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that have actually read my thesis, which is kind of mind blowing to me, by the way. Um, but in my thesis, I spelt her name Kaili with, a, with an Okina. I have since been told by her descendants that her name does not have an Okina. So we're not spelling it with an Okina anymore. Um, she was born on March 5th, 1847. She passed away in 1929. So she was 82 years when she passed away. Um, that's, a, that's a right long time for someone to have lived through all of that, yeah. She grew up in Manoa on Oahu and exactly where the UH Manoa campus resides today, which is why one of my areas of research is land ownership of the Manoa campus lands. <laughs> Everything originates with her. Uh, her mother was a chiefess named Kaili Kapuolono, and her father was a guy named Theophilus Metcalf. Through her mother's line, she was Koko Ali'i. So she was like a mid-level Ali'i line. And we'll talk about a little bit more about how that happened along the way. Um, she attended Oahu College, now known as Punahou School. And I found out from Punahou there that she was actually the first Kanaka Maoli student um, to attend Punahou School. And she was rather well respected amongst her peers when she attended there. She almost attended Mills Seminary in California because after she graduated, she was about to go to college. And they went up to California in 1866 to get her set up. And then that's when her father passed away while they were there in California. So she never actually attended Mills Seminary. She was about to, and then she had to come home and take care of her younger siblings. So she came back home, and within about a year after that, she married her first husband, Frederick Beckley. So she is related to the entire Beckley line, which if, if you start doing research is extensive. And the Beckleys are of a high chiefly ranking as well. Um, so through her kids, her kids are high, high chiefly rankings also. So this was very much an Ali'i match for their two family lines. Her second husband, um, after her first husband passed away, she married again about eight years later to Moses Nakuina, who was also of Kaukau Ali'i status. And we already got a Q&A before this, this webinar even started as to whether or not um, she was related to the Nakuinas of Moloka'i. And although I haven't traced his genealogy, I believe so, yes. Because Moses Nakawina's family was from Moloka'i. Um, I don't know any more than that yet. Uh, she is extraordinary in a lot of different ways. In one way, because she lived through six different rulers and six governments. Um, and not a lot of people in the 19th century can claim to have lived that long. So these are the six rulers that I'm talking about in case you just want to recap the history. Um, Kauikeoli, Kamehameha III, Alexander Liholiho, Kamehameha IV, Lota Kapuaiva, Kamehameha V, and then William Charles Lunalilo, David Kalakaua, and Lili'u Kalani. And had there been another ruler after that, she probably would have lived through six or seven or eight rulers. Um, she lived through six governments. I'm counting, there's the constitutional monarchy formed as of 1840 to 1893. However, due to the Bayonet Constitution in 1887, I'm counting that as its own government. So I'm calling it the Bayonet oligarchy. You guys can challenge me if you want, that's okay. Um, and then there's the provisional government from 1893 to 1895. That's when the Hawaiian monarchy was overthrown. And then from 1895 to 98 is the Republic of Hawaii when those overthrowers realized that they weren't gonna get seated by the United States. So they formed their own government. And then between 1898 to 1900, you have the US sort of taking over control through that US joint resolution. And then from 1900 on, you have the Organic Act, which really solidifies, well, solidifies is maybe not a good word, but 
establishes Hawaii as a territory. So that's six different governments that she lived through and she navigated her way through. And she managed to somehow succeed through. So let's talk about her parents because you know in Hawaii, everything is about who your parents are, right? Where your, where your lineage comes from. So her father was not from here. Her father was a descendant of Puritan immigrants who, they were one of the early founders of the city of Dedham, Massachusetts. They arrived there in 1637. So that's where his line was originally from um, once they got to the Americas. He is known as the first photographer in Hawaii. He set up a daguerreotype photography shop. It didn't last very long. And it's actually said, um, some people say that none of his daguerreotype uh, photos actually still exist. However, um, I have found daguerreotype photographs in the archives, both at Punahou and the, at the state archives that are unsigned. And so I'm wondering if maybe those were his photographs, but he didn't have the foresight to actually make a manufacturer or a um, photographer shop's stamp. So they're unsigned photographs. So I'm wondering if maybe his, some of his photographs actually do still exist. Um, he was also a land surveyor for the Mahele because he had some civil engineer training before he came to Hawaii. And he was regarded as one of the better um, surveyors for the Mahele. Take that as you will. Um, because of that, because he was a surveyor, he actually scoped out a lot of the lands that he wanted to purchase, which he did after, as soon as foreigners were able to purchase land, he purchased a lot of land. Um, so he benefited from the Mahele. He was Marshal of the Kingdom from 1849 to 1850. That was only one year. He didn't like being Marshal of the Kingdom because he was in charge of prisons. And believe it or not, back then the prisons didn't have walls. <laughs> so the prisoners could just walk in and out every day. <laughs> and he wrote into the legislature, he's like, we need money to build walls because there's no point in having a prison without walls. Um, and they wouldn't give him money so that's why he quit the job. <laughs> he was also superintendent of public works from 1852 to 55. And that was when they started initiating the Nuguanu Waterworks project. So he did a lot of the pre-planning for that. Now that's rather significant because I believe he actually got that position because of his wife's position as a kaukaulii. So we'll get to that in a moment. Um, he was a member of the House of Representatives just for one year. And he was a sugar planter from 1852 to 1856. The plantation is today, it's called Pepe'ekeo over in Hilo. Um, and actually, he didn't purchase that land under his own name. He purchased that land under Emma's, his daughter's name. And he purchased it when she was still a child. So there's a royal patent for it. It's under her name. And much, much later on as an adult, she testifies that she heard that um, after her birth, they had this great big party. I think it was called a pa palaha. I forget what it's called. Um, and all her relatives came and all her relatives gave, got, gave monetary gifts. So he took all of that money and use that money to purchase the plantation. So the plantation was supposed to be hers. Um, big controversy because after he died, he leaves it in his will to her, but then the trustees of his will actually don't let her run it and don't let her manage it. And she actually gets swindled out of the plantation. Um, and she's never able to recover. She, she didn't even really get to sell it for a good price. She's never able to recover that land. And she's, she was sore about it for the rest of her life that, that she lost that land. Um, she was married at the time that the land was being taken away from her. And she couldn't take the issue to court because at that time, women, there was a law called coverture where a woman couldn't do anything without the husband's permission. And her husband, who was Frederick Beckley at the time, wouldn't let her um, contest the sale because the person that was buying the plantation was his cousin's husband, Afong. So she lost her plantation after her husband, Frederick Beckley, died. She tried to take the issue to court again, 
But at that point, Ah Fong had owned it for several years and nobody would hear the case. So it was dropped. So I think that always stuck with her as a really negative um, event in her life. Um, anyway, her father was also a member of the Royal Hawaiian Agricultural Society as a sugar planter. And these are pictures of the Nu'uanu waterworks, which possibly he had a hand in planning. So her mother is Ka'ili Kapuo Lono, and she was a higher ranking Ali'iwahine. Um, her genealogy is, at least the people that I know about, she has, uh, uh, the mother's great grandfather was Kanalo Uo'o, who was in Ho uh, Hawaii Island Kahuna. Um, and her, uh, the mother's grandmother was Kalaniku Paolakea. If I'm reading Emma's text correctly, what that means is Kalaniku Paolakea is Kanaloa Uo'o's daughter. Okay. And Kalaniku Paolakea's mother is from the Kukaniloko chiefess line. So the mother's side is the Oahu Island family line. Now, Kalaniku Paolakea is an adult or close to being an adult, at least of marriage age, when Kamehameha I takes over Oahu, Oahu Island. So Kamehameha wanting to join his Mahi Island clan with the Kukaniloko line, he marries his general Nahili to Kalaniku Paolakea. So they are Emma's uh, great grandparents, Emma Nakuina's great grandparents. Um, I believe that one of the knowledge systems that comes down through these lines is the management of water. And there's a reason for that. And I think that's why Metcalf, the husband, was given the superintendent job at that time because they were thinking about doing the Nu'uanu waterworks. So they felt that there was this water knowledge within the family that he could draw from. Now here's why I suspect that her family line um, knew about water is because Kamehameha the fourth, when she was still just a child, he chose her, Emma Nakuina, or Emma Metcalf at the time rather, to be trained in traditional water use and rights. He also made her custodian of the laws of the Kamehamehas and an authority on the working of all ancient laws. That's a pretty hefty kuleana to be settled upon a child. Because at the time that he did this, Emma Nakuina was born, or Emma Metcalf rather, was born in 1847. He reigns in 1855 and he dies in 1863. So this happened some point during his reign. She's like 10 years old maybe when this happens. So that says something, right? That says something that, that there is this hefty kuleana in her family line. Otherwise she wouldn't have been given it. As an adult, she was a lady in waiting to Queen Kupi Olani and Queen Lili Okolani. Now lady in waiting, there's different ways of seeing that. Lady in waiting in the like stereotypical English way of thinking is that that lady is always there and does whatever that royal, royal person wants. And to a certain extent, it worked like that in Hawaii as well. Um, for example, when these two queens, and at the, at the time, Princess Lili Okalani went on a, um, went on a um, trip, um, Emma would go with them. Whenever any of these women started any kind of, uh, whenever, and sorry guys, Whenever any of these women started any of these kinds of um, organizations, like a sewing club, um, Lee Okalani at one point started a women's bank, um, quilting clubs, educational societies, these women started all kinds of organizations. And anytime they did that, Emma Metcalf, then Emma Beckley, and then later Emma Nakuina was right there with them and joining in all of these activities with them. Um, also, here's my great find. I just found this earlier today. There's one newspaper article that says that Emma Nakuina was godmother to Princess Ka'iulani. That was my aha moment just, just earlier today, like three hours ago. I'm so excited that, that I found that. So 
her professional positions and memberships. She was curatrix of the National Museum and Library. So curator is the word. Um, however, back then, uh, during the 19th century, they were all still really sort of attentive to the suffixes that denoted gender. So women often had a title that ended in an X, an IX. So, and she really called herself that. She called herself curatrix all the time rather than curator. Um, she got that position in 1882. She held it until 1887 when a lot of the museum, the museum basically shut down as a result of the bayonet constitution. And that's why soon thereafter, within the next three years or so, all the stuff that was at the Hawaiian National Museum, the majority of it ends up at the Bishop Museum. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the details of how that transfer happened, still trying to work out all of those threads. I still need to find more information about the, the actual process of that. But I do know that a lot of that stuff that's in the Bishop Museum came from the Hawaiian National Museum. She was also a notary public and grantor of marriage licenses. She was a translator and cultural advisor. Those guys that I showed you in the first slide of all the um, foreign chroniclers of Hawaiian history, um, some of them, especially Alexander and Thrum, used her a lot in their work. Sometimes they cite her, sometimes they don't. So they got, they built their names off of the backs of people like her and other people like her. She was also a translator for, at the schools at the time, they were still having Hawaiian language schools. And she would take a lot of the foreign, the American um, curriculum and translate it into Hawaiian for the, the Hawaiian schools. Then in um, 1892, she became commissioner of private ways and water rights for the district of Kona O'ahu, which is the Honolulu district where I'm sitting right now, the capital district. Um, that is no small accomplishment to be named to something like that, yeah. And she was the only woman to get that position. Um, and after the overthrow, so she got this position in 1892. She was able to keep it through the overthrow. And yes, she did have, have to sign the Oath of Allegiance to do so. Um, however, <laughs> another tangent. Um, when I looked up the signature of the Oath of Allegiance, a lot of the people that signed the Oath of Allegiance signed it within like the next day after the overthrow happened, January 17th. So like a lot of the people are signing on January 18th. She doesn't sign it until several days later. So I'm wondering if there's a reason for that pause, if there was some hesitancy on their part if she had to have conversations with people. Because we do know from other, from other ali'i at the time who were in prominent positions, we do know that the Liu Kalani told those people to go sign it so that they could keep their positions. And really, um, after the overthrow, after Liu Kalani is no longer queen, this, this position makes Emma Nakuina the highest ranking woman in the government. So that would have made her really, really, really important. Um, she was a member of the Hawaiian Historical Society. She was one of the first women, along with Tewita Henry, inducted into the Hawaiian Historical Society because you know it was a totally patriarchal, patriarchal system and it was all men until that time, right? And they had to like open themselves up to the idea that a woman could be smart. Um, anyway, she was also a member of the Daughters of Hawaii and she did a lot of historical work for them. She, after she retired from her water commissioner or her commissioner of private ways and water rights position, she became a teacher in the territorial school, which is what was, which is what McKinley was called. It was called, this is a weird name. It was called the normal school. Um, so she became a teacher there in 1915 and she was in charge of Hawaiian studies. She taught them mo'olalo. And she was, I just found this earlier today as well. She was a member of the Outdoor Circle. Um, I definitely wanna research that more because that sounds super interesting. So her job at the Hawaiian National Museum, 
Um, the Hawaiian National Museum was, was originally commissioned in 1872 by Kamehameha V. Um, it wasn't completed during that time because there was a lot of changeover. Kamehameha V passed away. Um, there wasn't enough funding, whatnot, long story. Um, but then the first curator that was named to the Hawaiian National Museum was Harvey Retchford Hitchcock. And he was also inspector general of the schools at the time. So he actually, he had two jobs. So he didn't focus a lot of attention on the museum. The next curator was David Dwight Baldwin and he was a scientist. So he actually did add a lot of mea to the um, museum itself, right? But then in 1882, Walter Murray Gibson becomes Minister of Foreign Affairs and he starts lobbying that the museum needs to be taken out of the Department of Education and needs to be put into his department, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Because a museum, at this time in history, museums are big deals. Expositions are going around, on around the world and all these national powers use museums to show their might and their glory to the rest of the world. So he argues that um, this museum should be under the purview of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And once that is transferred, then he appoints Emma Beckley, because she's, she's the widow Beckley at that time, to become the next curator or curatrix. And under her tutelage, the national collection was considered prized. So she's the first curator that just really, really made the museum what it was. And then, of course, like I mentioned earlier, it got severely impacted by the Bayonet Constitution. And then in 1891, the bulk of that collection was transferred to the Bishop Museum. Um, a lot of the books in the Hawaiian Government Library actually got, got transferred to the Hawaii State Library also. So a lot of those things that she touched are still in our repositories today. Um, there, there was a really, now it's comical, back then she probably wouldn't have seen it as comical. Um, once the Bishop Museum forms, they do not choose her to become the next curator. They go to William Tufts Brigham, who is from the East Coast, right? Um, and he came to Hawaii in 1864 and he taught at Oahu College for one year and they would have overlapped. She would have been a student there at the year that he taught. And I think it would have been her last year there actually. Um, and the course that he taught was Agassiz and Gould's Zoology and Loomis's Geology. And Agassiz was his teacher. And Agassiz was well known for the theory of polygenism, the idea that, gen that all people are genetically predispositioned to be um, superior or inferior. So it's based on race. It's a race-based theory, right? And Emma being the only Hawaiian student at the time, can you imagine how she would have felt being taught something like that? And knowing the kind of woman that she was, she wouldn't have just stood by and not said anything. She would have challenged him. And I believe that she did because when he comes back all of these years later, um, 30 years later, he comes back and he hates her. Oh my God, he hates her with a passion. There are letters where he calls her by all kinds of horrible names. It's just, at the time, I'm sure it must've been horrible, but now it's hilarious. Um, so he becomes the first curator in 1892. He becomes the director in 1898. But then in 1897, they have an incident. And she's sitting, on, she's sitting on the grounds of the Bishop Museum, her and her friends, and they're watching. At that time, the Kamehameha Schools for Boys was in the building right next door. So the Kamehameha Schools boys were out doing military ROTC training. So people would often come to watch because you know back then, no more TV, right? No more movies. So people would go and watch things like this. So there was a bunch of people out on the lawn watching this happening and Brigham comes to work and he sees her and her friends sitting on the lawn. So he sends a janitor out to tell them to leave. Um, incident ensues. He actually gets fired for a brief period of time, but then the trustees bring him back. And then 20 years later 
1917, something similar happens again. She comes to the museum. She brings a group of visiting Hawaiians to the museum. Um, he berates her in front of them in public. So she leaves. But this time, one of the trustees of the museum is there and he witnesses the whole exchange. And so because of that, Brigham finds And this time they don't welcome him back. So she actually got Brigham fired. Um, as commissioner in private ways and water rights for the district of Kona Oahu, she was regarded as an expert. And um, I found a newspaper, I found an article by her where she says that she is the longest to hold that position. Of all the people that have held that position, she held it longer than anybody else. Um, and I found these quotes from the newspapers. She was declared to be the best informed Hawaiian woman in the territory on land matters. Um, and she was also called in, not just as a water commissioner because water commissioners were by district, yeah? So she was actually called in on a case on Maui for Lahaina Luna water rights in 1904. And the dis assistant attorney general, Noah Aluli, um, employed her as his co-counsel. So even though she wasn't a lawyer, she was regarded with the expertise necessary to be able to perform the function of both a lawyer and a judge. So I wanted to address this because I gave this presentation back in 2018 at the Judiciary History Center. I did a talk on Emma Nakuina and in the promotional material for that particular talk, it called her Hawaii's first female judge. And I had a lot of questions because it was at the Judiciary History Center. So there were a lot of lawyers in the audience at that time. Um, and people were really asking, was she really a judge? Was she really a judge? And I actually had one woman come up to me at the end of that and insist, no, she wasn't a judge. And at that time, I was like, I was trying to, you know, step lightly around the issue. Was she a judge? Wasn't she a judge? And I would say that she performed the function of a judge. But since that time, I have actually gone into the private ways and water rights case documents. I've read through a number of those case documents. I know exactly what a commissioner did. And I'm going to come out and declare now to everybody in the whole world, she was a judge. Yeah. Because what the water commissioners did was they presided over cases, there was a plaintiff, there was a defendant, each of those employed lawyers, they would come to a courtroom, they would be sworn in, they would bring witnesses, um, all the testimony was recorded by a court transcriber, they had to file petitions, they had to file documents, and then when she made her decision, she wrote it up like any other court judgment and it was legally binding. So I'm gonna say she was a judge. Um, also, I found a newspaper article from here, from Hawaii, in which they call her Judge Emma Nakuina. So if they called her that, I'm gonna call her that. Um, but to further this, there was an article that went viral I guess you could say viral. It was published in several newspapers across the United States in 1910. And it was American Woman, a Judge in Hawaii. And these on this slide are all the newspapers that ran that particular article. They all called her a judge. This is the text of that article. It's actually super short. Um, Honolulu, Hawaii, an American woman, Mrs. Nakuina, has made herself a power in Hawaii. She holds a unique position in the territorial government. She is a water rights commissioner and sits as a judge to decide cases where the rights are in litigation and is considered an able and most just official. Her decisions, if sel seldom, if ever, being set aside. Um, the rest of the article talks about her, her life situation, and they're actually wrong. <laughs> So although I'm advocating that, yes, she was a judge, whoever wrote this article is not correct because it says that she is the great granddaughter of Captain Metcalf 
the captain of the Eleanor, the one that's responsible for the Oluwalu massacre. And I researched that. I researched it a lot and I proved it's not correct. She is not related to that Metcalf. Yeah. Um, her father, who was a graduate of Harvard, that's actually not true either. But from, all, from what I can tell, Emma didn't know that. Emma believed that her father was a graduate and likely because that's what her father told her. But it's actually not true. He actually never went to Harvard. Um, and that he's a nephew of the late Chief Justice Metcalf of Massachusetts. That is sort of true. He is related to the Chief Justice Met Metcalf of Massachusetts, but not a nephew. He's like, like second or third cousins. So she's a judge. Now, she's also very, very well known for her publications. Um, and this is really how a lot of us were introduced to her again, because like I said, um, those other guys are most well known. Her name wasn't very well known until recently, until the last maybe 10 years or so. So this is a list of all of her publications. While she was curatrix of the Hawaiian Government Museum, she had to write a pamphlet to, for, that accompanied um, a bunch of items that were going to an exposition in England, the Hawaiian Fisheries and Methods of Fishing. And apparently that gave her the writing bug because from that point on, she just started publishing and publishing and publishing. So that same year, right after that fisheries pamphlet was done, she started writing serials for the newspaper. And the first one she did was Hi'iaka. Um, and then she wrote Kahalo Puna. Then from 1884, 1884 to 86, there's a bunch of Mo'olelo in Thrums Annual reports. Um, and she writes uh, commentaries into the newspaper. So one of the commentaries that she writes into the newspaper is a letter because the government has decided to make a park. And she advocates for calling it a'ala park and what it should look like and what kinds of features it should have. So we have her to thank for the fact that it's called A'ala Park. Then the Bayonet Constitution happens and Kalakaua's book, The Legends and Myths of Hawaii is published shortly thereafter and they reprint her Kahalo Puna story in that book. Um, then in 1893, the overthrow happens and her version of the Punahou Spring comes out shortly thereafter. Now, to be fair, when this went to print was before the overthrow. So she didn't know that the overthrow was going to happen when that got published. Um, but sometimes I wonder if Emma was sort of precognizant because a lot of the things that she said and did were very eerily timely and correct. Um, I'll show you why after. Um, in 1894, she publishes her treatise, which is probably one of the most important things she ever did. A treatise called Ancient Hawaiian Water Rights and Some Customs Pertaining to Them. And we still use that as a primary source on how water was managed in pre-contact Hawaii. We still use that today. More legends, the legends of the shark man Nanawe, the legend of Ohunui. And then she wrote an art article with, um, uh, actually it's not W.D. Alexander, I need to correct my slide. It was Atkinson, I believe. Um, they interviewed the oldest living inhabitant in Hawaii. And that article also went viral across the United States as well. So it was republished in several newspapers across the United States. Then um, in 1904, she gets commissioned by the Hawaiian Promotion Committee, which is essentially the forerunner of the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Because now that they've been taken over by the US, they want a bunch of American tourists to come here, right? So they contract a number of people to write pamphlets to promote tourism to Hawaii. She's the only Hawaiian that they contract to do so. Um, and as Christina Bakalega says in her book, this is the only one of all that pamphlets that was never reprinted <laughs> because the stuff she says in it was not exactly favorable to foreigners. And I guess maybe it didn't have the effect that they wanted. Um, then she gives a bunch of talks for like Komakapili Church, for the Daughters of Hawaii. So some of these are not published. I just know that she did them, but I don't know the script of them. Like the Mo'o of Konohuanui. 
Um, then she's got a bunch of stuff in 1907. 1907 is the year that she retires from being a water commissioner. And so I don't think it's any accident that all of a sudden she starts writing more after this. Um, if you notice though, a lot of the things that she writes about are focused on Manoa. And that's because that's where she grew up. And so she's telling stories from her Onehanao. All of her publications though were in English. I have yet to find anything that she published in Hawaiian because if she did, she didn't sign her name to them. So I can't tell that that's her or not. Um, I have a theory, I have a working theory on that, that she used her skill and notoriety to critique the aggressive maneuvering of the Haole in the kingdom through her use of kauna. Because if you read through all of her stories, um, even though they're in English, she still employs Kauna through the place names that she uses, through the names of the characters that she uses, and through the types of things that happen in the stories. So I believe that she's actually addressing a Hawaiian audience, one her Hawaiian that knows the Hawaiian culture, that knows the Hawaiian background, and they're able to see those deeper levels in these stories. But because it's in English, all the haole who were aggressive, and, and she's the one that they're criticizing, they only read the surface level of the story. So she's criticizing them to their faces and they don't even know it. Um, I gotta believe that she was kind of tickled about that because I am. Um, <laughs> anyway, I believe that she also wrote in English because she was hoping to teach the foreigners because she didn't feel like she needed to teach the Hawaiians. The ones who needed the education was the foreigners. Like, this is how we are. You got to start, con you got to start compromising to us. Yeah. So I think that that's why she didn't write in Hawaiian because back then everybody still spoke Hawaiian. There was no need. Yeah. So I think she wrote only in English because she wanted to educate the, the people that spoke English. Thank goodness though, that she did because I don't know if she really foresaw, but maybe she did because I suspect she was precognizant um, that there would become a time when most Hawaiians don't speak Hawaiian anymore. And for a lot of us in the 20th century that weren't raised Hawaiian, um, we were reintroduced to ourselves through her stories because they were accessible to us in English. And that's certainly how I got back into it. Yeah. So we got to really thank her for that. Um, the reason why I suspect she was criticizing Haole while she was writing to them is because she would do she would do digs like small little digs in her writing, and you really got to read to get them, but they're there. So this is from her Punahou Spring story. Um, it's when the land and spring passed into the hands of foreigners who allowed the springs to be defiled by the washing of unclean articles and by the bathing of unclean persons, the twins indignantly left the place. So she's totally criticizing the foreigners, right? Um, these are excerpts from her tourism book, which is probably why it didn't get reprinted. They had historians, genealogists, bards, and poets, and all the concomitants of the medieval aristocracy of Europe or Asia. So she's um, ho'ohanohanoing the Hawaiian people, right? She's making them equal to that of any monarchy in Europe. They were industrious people. The chiefs always took the lead in any industrial project so as to keep the respect and allegiance of their people. Now she knows full well that in European societies, they didn't do that. So she's again making a commentary, yeah? The chiefs were right there with their hands in it. Um, they were tillers of the soil with well-known rules and regulations for the cultivation and harvesting of every economical plant known to them. So she's saying about how intelligent Hawaiians were in a day and age when everybody around the world was trying to denigrate all in, in, um, indigenous peoples. Now here's where she starts criticizing the foreigners. Skillful and daring fishermen with a thorough knowledge of the habitat and habit of fishes, the seasons of their periodical migration, spawning, etc. And they had stringent laws and regulations for the taking of fish looking towards their preservation. Fish were abundant in the waters surrounding the Hawaiian islands in those days. Alas, the white man with his alleged superior knowledge 
prevailed on chief and commoner to throw down their wholesome restrictions as savoring of superstition with the result that fishes are very scarce in Hawaiian waters and getting more and more so every year. That's a pretty outright obvious dig at the foreigners, yeah. So no, no surprise as to why her book wasn't republished. Um, but to sum up, she was very well regarded by society at the time. Um, lots and lots of things I've read about her were very complimentary. And this is, um, this actually comes from a newspaper article that celebrates her 50th birthday. And this is why I use this term in my thesis title for the benefit of her race, because it comes from this newspaper article. And the quote was, our newly arrived citizens are probably unaware that there are but few ladies in Hawaii Nei who have wrought so much by deed, pen, and words for the benefit of her race. That's her signature there on the bottom of that slide. Um, she autographed one of her copies. So that's her handwriting right there. So that is Emma Nakuina in a nutshell. Um, she's an amazing woman, someone that we really need to start listing along with those other Hawaiian scholars um, because she did a lot for us and she's still doing a lot for us today. So mahalo. Uluvehi, thank you. That was, it, it's fantastic. And there were definitely some new additions um, that you found out, including the, the piece about her being the godmother of Kayulani. So thank you so much. It's really amazing, this woman, and such an appropriate time to recognize and honor her, which is always, but especially telling the stories of women in, here in Hawaii whose stories are not known, especially during this commemoration of suffrage and basically women and the power of women and the power women had even behind the scenes or what, though they may not have been given the platform. Um, so we do have some questions. Um, let's see, um, do you know of any lands that Emma and Fred Beckley own together is one. Um, yeah, they actually did own land together. And I think they, they own land in Molokai. Um, at, oh, I gotta go look up the name. It's Mo'o, 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 Mo'o something. Um, and she lived there for, after her retirement from the Water Commission, she lived there in Molokai. So she had actually a rather extensive land base. So yes, they, they, they did have land together. Um, and there's a lot of land transactions. So I haven't actually created a full inventory yet of everything that she owned. Great. Um, yes, Mo'omomi. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, great. Someone asked um, that you mentioned that Emma published multiple Mo'olelo. Was she a native speaker of Hawaiian? Yes, yes, she was a native speaker of Hawaiian. Um, but again, she didn't publish anything Hawaiian. And that's why, that's one of the things that was really curious. And that's one of the things that sort of drove my research questions, because if she's, if she's an, a native speaker, why isn't she writing in Hawaiian, you know? So yes, she was a native speaker. And when she gave talks at like Komakapili Church and whatnot, she gave them in Hawaiian. Cool. Someone asked, um, have you come across any personal journal, journals or letters of hers? If so, what do they say of her interior life? No, I don't have any personal journals or letters of her. That's one thing I don't have. Everything I have is from archival documents that can be found in like newspapers or the state archives. So I get a lot of her thoughts from those documents in the state archives because, for example, um, the probate for her father's will actually took nine years because she contested it so much. So she ends up writing a very lengthy letter where she tells the whole story from her side. So I get I get a lot of her personality and her thoughts from, th from those kinds of documents. And again, when she tries to get her plantation back, 
um, the court documents have a letter from her as well, talking about her situation and how she wanted to contest it at the time, but she couldn't. So I do get her personal writings from things like that, but I don't have anything that's like a journal or a personal letter or anything. Um, someone's curious about, do you, about more detail on her involvement in the women's suffrage movement in Hawaii. Do you have any information about that? I, I don't have a lot of information. I was, <laughs> I was systematically searching through the newspapers over the last two days. Um, and I got so caught up by the, all the really cool things that I found that I actually never got to find anything about suffrage. Um, she is mentioned in newspapers literally hundreds of times in both Hawaiian language newspapers and English language newspapers, hundreds. I'm talking like 600 easy if you combine those those two, you know, the English and the Hawaiian together. Yeah. Um, so I'm still searching. Um, but I do know that she a lot of the suffrag suffragettes here in Hawaii were her family members through her through her Beckley relations. A lot of them were. Um, and there was one newspaper article that said that she hosted a suffragette meeting. So, you know, and, and her status as being a judge and being a very well-recognized person in the society. And you know, she had to get a lot of flack for being the only female judge, right? So I, I imagine that she had to have been involved in that. I just haven't found the evidence for it yet. It's fair to say this is an ongoing uh, project for you because you're working on, you're, you're finishing or almost completing your PhD dissertation on this, but I feel like you're going to continue to research this indefinitely, perhaps, because oh, yeah. it, it's, it's, yeah. it's a big passion for you, and it's really um, wonderful for everyone here and everyone in Hawaii to benefit from that research. Um, I think we have time for a couple more, and then what we'll do as well is we can collect all the questions, and of course, the ones that we didn't um, weren't able to have Uluvehi answer right now, and we will make sure that we allow her to do so, and we'll post that later, and I'll send out, I have everyone's email address, send out information to you to let you know when that's available on our website. Um, someone asked- Oh, we have her descendants on here. Oh, you, I think you do, yeah. Um, someone was wondering what types of exhibits or collections she curated at the Hawaii National Museum. Do we have information um, on that? There, there is actually, there is um, information about the items that were in the museum because she created the most extensive inventory. Um, but I don't believe that she put on any special exhibits. You know how, you know how today the Bishop Museum will like, like do dinosaurs for a couple months or, you know, stuff on Rapa Nui for a couple months, right? Um, I don't think they did that back then because back then museums were still really new. Yeah, museums really only emerged out of, out of the age of imperialism. So the earliest museum only goes back to like the late 1700s. So in the 1800s, museums were still really, really new. So they didn't put on like special exhibits like we do today. It was just stuff. You know, they put all the stuff and they categorize all the stuff and then you come and you look at it. And then back then they would have, the curator would come and give you a personal tour. So as far as what she, uh, what exhibit she did, that I don't know. I can, I, all I can tell you is what was there, the maya that was there in the museum at the time. Thank you. Um, somebody was asking if your thesis will be available online eventually. Um, it's actually been online since 2012. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, you can get it through Scholarspace. It's it's kind of it's kind of trippy because I didn't know that people actually read my thesis until a couple right. of years ago. People started reading it, mm -hmm. and it's got like over four thousand downloads. You um, mentioned that. You mentioned yeah. that. I can't top. even. I can't even process that. I, I didn't. I didn't know that that many people really wanted to know about her. So, but there are mistakes in it. I've been told by her descendants that I, I made a couple mistakes. So <laughs> it is going to have to be updated at some point yeah sure. and someone else had mentioned or had asked a question about um 
you providing a list of resources that you use for your research, which I'm imagining would be included in your thesis, which is online. Would yes. that be accurate? Okay, so we'll make that available, um, everyone. I think there's a lot, there's probably a lot more questions. So I think in the name of, of honoring people's time, I could maybe, um, if everyone's willing to stand for another minute or two since we started, we had a little bit of a bumble on the start. Um, I think we can, we have time for one more and then we will address other people's questions as I mentioned afterwards. And then I just like to thank everyone and say goodbye. Um, did she, this is interesting. Oh, go ahead. Did you want, did you want to address any? Cause you have access to the Q and A if there's something in particular that you want to respond. I saw Christina said she's on my dissertation committee. She's like, do the dissertation. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I also um, do want to state that, um, you know, most of the stuff that I addressed here in this slideshow today is in the bibliography of my thesis, but not all of it, because I actually have added, I've found more things since then. So not everything that I used here today can be found in the bibliography of, of my thesis. Okay, that's good to know, because I know one person, and, and of course you just found this, what was it yesterday or a few days ago about the, the godmother um, of Kaiulani, and somebody yeah. had asked like, that what was yeah, that's really, that's incredible. What was the resource or what was the newspaper that you had found that in was one of the questions. And you can either adjust that now or we can share that later on the on the board. Um, it is the Honolulu Star Bulletin, October 16, 1916, page one, column four. Wow. Very great. That's awesome. Um, I think we are so grateful that you chose to honor us with this presentation for our inaugural, inaugural virtual event. It's been really amazing to, I, I love Emma Nakuina. I think she's such a fire starter and like inspiration for women everywhere, you know, as much back then as now too. And I'm so grateful that you have a passion to share her history and that you'll be sharing more. Um, so I think we'll, we'll end here just to respect your time and everyone's time. And, um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening and we hope you enjoyed the presentation. I want to thank my colleague, Michelle Kisek, who's been graciously monitoring our YouTube, um, live stream and fielding questions and helping behind the scenes. And I encourage everyone here who's not already signed up for our HHF e-newsletter at historichawaii.org to register so that we can continue to share with you events like this and other opportunities to learn and engage with Hawaii's historic places. If you'd like to support HHF in our work, um, you can navigate to the join us section on our website's menu bar to learn more. And we hope you all have a wonderful evening and that you and your loved ones stay healthy and inspired during these these unusual times. So thank you so much, oh. Uluvi. Mahalo, everybody. Oh my God, I'm Mahalo seeing everyone. <laughs> Mahalo, everybody, for coming. Mahalo. Thank you so much. Email me too at Andrea at historichawaii.org if you have other questions and if you want us to forward more questions to Uluvehi, and we'll be happy to do that. Thank you, everyone. We'll be doing more of these. We'll keep you posted. Thanks everyone. Aloha. Aloha.